Good morning, Grace Life. I'm glad you're here this morning on this wonderful snowy day outside. I hope you're going to get a chance to enjoy the two, three, four foot of snow that we received. I don't have any idea how much snow we actually received because I'm recording this ahead of time because I kind of had this idea that we might have to postpone services on Sunday because of the snow that was coming. So I'm glad that you decided to join in, to tune in as we continue our series on Sermon on the Mount. And today I'm really excited because we're going to be studying and looking at the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is this great prayer that Jesus sets out so to be a model prayer for you and I. Not just to be a rote prayer where we just repeat these words, repeat these words, repeat these words as a mantra or some kind of good luck charm, but it's a model that we can use to follow to know how we should pray to God. It gives us this background. It gives us this example. And he says, if you follow this model, you follow these patterns, you will have a good prayer. So those of you who are watching right now and you're always wondering, I don't know how to pray. I hope nobody calls on me to pray. I don't want to be asking a Bible study to pray or pray out loud because I just don't know what to pray. I can't pray those King James prayers. You know, O Lord, if we thanketh thou for all the blessing that you've provided for us. Right, those King James prayers with the big words and the big ideas. Today, you're going to see how God is not necessarily about all the big words and the mantras and all the, the flowery language. It's about a simple act of love. It's about a simple act of worship. As we come before God, it's an act of worship. See, the prayer, the model prayer that Jesus gives to us is in direct opposition to what the, the religious leaders of that time have been doing. Remember, we've been studying as we go through, as we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount, we've been looking at how the Pharisees and the Sadducees, everything they did in their religious activities was meant to draw attention to themselves. They would stand on the street corners and pray, oh, pray for me, oh God, you are wonderful. And they're letting everybody around see them and their religiosity, see them and their spiritualness, to see them and how holy they are, whether it's through their prayers, they're fasting, and really anything as they're fasting, they're putting on sackcloth and ashes, and they're making their faces all, oh, they're making their faces so anxious for food and hurting, and people all know that they're fasting because the attention's on them. Or when they go into the temple to give their tithe and their offering, they come out with this big roll of coins, and they drop the coins into this big metal basin so everybody hears how much is going into that basin. It's all about seeing them. It's all about their recognition. It's all about drawing attention to themselves because they want to be seen by men. And so what Jesus has been teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount to all the people who are listening below and there on the Mount, and not just the normal people, but the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders at that time as well, as they're all listening, he is pointing out and drawing attention to those people who want to have all the attention drawn to themselves. In some circles, this prayer that we're going to look at this morning, the, the uh, Lord's Prayer, it's, it's called the Our Father in some circles, and some religious, uh, some churches around us. And so they want to just repeat this prayer, the Our Father, the Our Father. And they're going to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And they repeat this prayer, and then they go on to the next thing, and Our Father who art in heaven, uh, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And they go on to the next thing, Our Father who art in heaven. And they're repeating this prayer as if the very words of this prayer are magic. And they're going to ward off the evil spirits, or they're going to bring them good luck or they're going to help keep their car running a little bit longer, or they're going to do some, God's going to do some magic for them because of the many words that they are speaking. Remember last week as we talked about Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, he said, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard by their many words. That's exactly what people who do this, who repeat this prayer over and over and over again are doing. They're just like those Gentiles. Our Father who art in heaven, our Father who art in heaven, our Father who art in heaven, our Father who art in heaven. 
Or how about this? Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord be with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I know we've all heard those prayers. We've heard those things repeated over and over again. And what they are doing is not really a prayer at all. It's doing exactly what Jesus is saying here. Don't do, because if you do that, you're being like the Gentiles. Verse 7 again. Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard by their many words. See, those repetitive prayers mean absolutely nothing. Ultimately mean nothing. They're just empty words, empty phrases. They don't get the attention of God, except that maybe he goes, really? Because God wants us to come at him in prayer as an act of worship, as everything in our life should be, right? Everything in our life should be an act of worship, but especially that prayer time. Because what are we doing when we pray? We're communicating directly with the God of the universe. Directly with the God of the universe. It's not some spirit. It's not just some statue, not just some picture on a wall or some crucifix hanging there to remind us. We are communicating directly with the God of the universe. And we can't come at him, communicate with him flippantly. We have to come and communicate with him directly as he intends to be dealt with and as an act of worship. So let's break this down. Let's take a look at this prayer then. We're only going to look at, the, at a few verses here this morning. We're going to go through uh, verse 15. And we're going to stop there this morning. And I want us to really key in to what it is that Jesus is teaching us here in this model prayer. First of all, notice that this is authentic prayer, right? We were talking about authentic faith last week. This is authentic prayer. Traditionally, we've called this prayer the, the, the Lord's Prayer. It's been the Lord's Prayer for years and years and years. But really, it's the disciples' prayer. See, this prayer is what Jesus is teaching to the disciples how they ought to pray. Is teaching them how they ought to pray to communicate with the God of this universe. The purpose of prayer is to glorify God's name and to ask for help to accomplish his will on earth. Ultimately, that's the purpose. It's to glorify God's name and ask for his help to accomplish his will on this earth. So we don't come at God as if he's some Santa Claus who's just going to bring a big bag of gifts, who's going to give us whatever we want, whatever we need. We're praying to the God of the universe because we want to glorify his name. We want his will to be accomplished and we want him to enlist our help in doing that. We want to be part of that plan. So look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. What does he say there? Pray then like this, right? Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This prayer, this prayer, this model prayer that, we, that Jesus is teaching us, it is a very first act of worship. When you wake up in the morning, worshiping God ought to be on the forefront of your mind. As you're going throughout your day, worshiping God should be on the forefront of your mind. As you're sitting down to meal, to dinner and lunch and breakfast, worshiping God should be on the forefront of your mind. As you go to bed at night, worshiping God should be on the forefront of your mind. See, any time you go through the day, Anytime you spend time with him, anytime that you pray, you are worshiping God. So let's break this prayer down just a little bit. Let's take a look and see what is it that Jesus is trying to get across to us as we are praying. What attitudes, what understanding should we have for God? First of all, he says, therefore, pray like this. Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. See, this now is in direct opposition to what we talked about earlier, about the Pharisees who are always pointing to themselves, 
to say, look at me, look at me, I want to be seen. Jesus is saying, our Father in heaven, he is the unseen one that we are praying to. He is the unseen one that we are to give our admiration and our worship to. He is the unseen one that comes in and transforms our lives. He is the unseen one whose will is being worked off around this whole world. He is the unseen one. He is our Father in heaven who is hearing all of our prayers. He is the Lord Most High. What else does it say about him? It says, your name is to be honored as holy. Your name is to be honored as holy. That's acknowledging his base character. That's acknowledging that he who he is, is this holy God of the universe who cannot stand to have sin in his presence. This holy God who demands also holiness from us. This holy God who is working out his will in this world. We're acknowledging his character. We're, and in acknowledging his character as holy, we're acknowledging our sinfulness. We're saying, God, I'm not worthy to come before you. God, I'm not worthy to speak your name. God, I'm not worthy. And I don't just take a knee and pray. Let's take a knee and ask that God will wipe me off the face of the earth because I am so unholy compared to him who is the perfection. He is the epitome of holiness. He is the very essence of holiness, the essence of perfection, the essence of sinlessness. That is who God is. That is who we are communicating. He says, our Father in heaven, your name is to be honored as holy. In other words, not even not taken, uh, made light of, not making fun of his name, not turning his name into something funny or some kind of joke, but treating it as special. His very name is special. Jesus goes on, he says, your kingdom come. He's acknowledging the magnitude and expanse of all of God's territory. God, your kingdom is not just in heaven. Your kingdom is here on earth. And we want the kingdom that you're setting up to come right now. We want your kingdom to be present right now. We want you to have the authority in your kingdom right now. Let me as your servant, let me as your citizen of your kingdom, Take part right now. When we come before Jesus, when we come before God, we acknowledge, God, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're acknowledging that God, all of the, all this that we live in, all this place, this house, this, this universe where we are existing at the moment, it's all his. It is all his. And we're saying, God, you have your way. You have your way with my job. You have your way with my family. You have your way with my life. You have your way with my future. You have your way with my present. And God, as you have your way, let me be willing to join you in that. On earth as it is in heaven. See, God's throne is not just in heaven. We picture him on the throne in heaven, right? We picture him sitting on this massive, massive throne, and he fills the whole temple. The Bible says his train of his robes, the train of his robes fills the temple. And we picture God as this huge, massive being sitting on this massive, massive throne in heaven. But you know what? He is also sitting on this massive, massive throne here in this world. This world that we live in is his. We are asking that his kingdom would be exalted and made light here in this world. He goes on, Jesus goes on in verse 11. He says, give us today our daily bread. What are we doing? We acknowledge that. We're acknowledging his provision. We're acknowledging his provision for our lives. We're saying, God, 
I don't know where my next meal is going to come from. I don't know where my retirement's going to come from. I don't know what's going to happen with the stock market. I don't know what's going to happen with my job. I don't know if I'm going to get a job. But I'm trusting you for it. I'm trusting you for this provision. I'm trusting that you are going to care for me and you are going to take care of me. Later on, we're going to read in, 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 in chapter, in a little bit further on in chapter six, 7, how God this says, if, if he cares, in chapter 6 rather, he cares for the sparrows. He sees the, the bird fall from the, from the sky. He cares for the flowers of the field and how they are arrayed in glory and beauty. And if he cares for the flowers and the birds of the field, how much more does he care for us? He provides for them. He lets water rain down for the, for the flowers and he provides food for the, for the animals. How much more is he going to provide for us? We say, God, give us today our daily bread. Just what I need, you provide it for me. And I'm going to be satisfied, content with what you provide. See, there's the key there. There's a real key there. This contentment, Paul talks about it later on in the New Testament. He talks about being content with wherever he is at. He's content in prison. He's content on the boat. He's content in the safe harbor. He's content at sea when the waves are crashing in. He is content because he knows he's in the center of God's will. He may be trying to get out of the danger zone, but he's content with where God has him. We acknowledge God's provision. So first of all, we acknowledge the unseen God, the unseen Most High God. We also acknowledge His character, His holiness, right? We acknowledge the magnitude and expanse of His territory. We acknowledge His provision. Number five, we acknowledge His mercy and His grace. Look what He says there in verse 12. He says, and, and, and give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts. Acknowledging that we have sinned against the Holy God, that we have done wrong, that we owe a debt to God, a debt that we can't pay. See, Jesus didn't owe a debt. He came and paid our debt. We owed a debt that we could not pay in our whole entire lifetime. Jesus came and died for us to pay that debt for us. His mercy and his grace overshadowing, overflowing all that we are. We're saying, God, forgive me my sins. Forgive me of my debts. See, if we think of our sin in that way, we think of our sin as a debt we have to pay back to a bank. I mean, none of us would ever not just pay back our mortgage. We would not just pay back our car loan. We would just, we, we, none of us would just not pay back our, our credit cards. We would not even think of that. Because they're going to come after us, right? If I don't pay my mortgage or my rent, they're going to kick me out of my house. If I don't pay my car loan, they're going to repossess my car. If I don't pay my credit cards, they're going to come after me with interest and charges and interest and penalties, and it's never going to get away from me. They will collect. God is the ultimate debt collector, but rather than coming at us and saying, you have a debt that you can never pay, so therefore you've got to be my slave, my servant, he came out of whole heaven. He came out of his throne in glory. And he lived on this earth and lived and died this per he lived this perfect life and he died for you and I, paying the debt that we could not pay. His mercy and his grace so massive. He forgave our debts. And as we pray this, God forgive me my debts. He says I have if you, are, if you are one of his children, your debts are already forgiven. If you have bowed your knee and you said, Jesus Christ, forgive me of my sins. I want to receive you as my Lord and Savior today. He forgives all of your sins. Not some, not many, not most, all. That little three-letter word, A-L-L, -L, all, it's a powerful word. Powerful, powerful word. See, every single one, all of my sins have been forgiven. All those in my past, all the ones I committed today, all the ones I'm going to commit next week, they've already been forgiven. God says, I forgive you. Those debts, 
gone. But we don't stop there. Verse 12. He says, and we have also forgiven our debtors. You see what happens there? As a response to the gift of God, a response to the, the, the saving, the, the, the forgiveness of God and forgiving our debts, we are in turn expected to forgive others with the same measure that God has forgiven us. See, as his children, we are also expected to show his mercy and grace to others. It's expected. God says, I forgave you. You now go and do the same. I forgave you of your sins. Now you go and you forgive that person who offended you. You go and do it. Period. We are expected to live out this changed heart. And then he says, do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Do not deliver us into temptation. Do not bring us into temptation, rather, but deliver us from the evil one. What are we what's he saying there? We are acknowledging God's deliverance from ongoing sin in our lives. Even though our debt is forgiven, even though we are not being held responsible for the sin eternally, ultimately God has already been done, been dealt with, and been forgiven, we are still responsible now to stay away from sin in our own lives, personal sin in our own lives. And so we're saying, God, do not bring me into temptation. Keep me away from temptation. Do not allow me to fall into temptation. Because I know my weaknesses, and you know my weaknesses, and Satan knows my weaknesses. And I do not want to give in to the temptation that Satan is going to bring upon me. He says, and deliver me from the evil one. Deliver me from the evil one. Who is the evil one? Satan is. Very simply. He's not some red demon-looking creature that you see in cartoons with a little pointy ears and a tail and a pitchfork. That's a lie that Hollywood has thrown out there to make us kind of look at Satan a different way. Satan is a real being who hates your guts, despises you, and wants you to fall into sin so he can laugh and tell God, look at that person. Look at this person who says they follow you. Look at them. Look how they're sinning against your holy name. And he can use us potentially as a means of just laughing at God. So we're asking God, we say, deliver me from the evil one. Deliver me from the evil one. So that's authentic prayer, right? Authentic prayer says, God, I acknowledge that you are unseen, that you are the most high. Authentic prayer says, I'm acknowledging your character, your holiness. Authentic prayer says, I'm acknowledging the expanse and the magnitude of your territory. It exists right in heaven, it exists right here. A holy prayer, authentic prayer rather, also acknowledges God's provision. Authentic prayer acknowledges God's mercy and his grace to forgive. Authentic prayer also recognizes that we are to forgive others. And an authentic prayer is asking for deliverance from sin. But what happens once a person has received forgiveness? What's to happen once a person has had their debts satisfied? See, Jesus doesn't just stop there with giving people a model. He kind of goes back to the end of verse 12. And in in verse 14 and 15, he goes back and expounds on that just a little bit. He says in verse 14 and 15, he says, forgiveness shows a changed heart. Look at this. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive your offenses. I don't know about you, but that is always, that verse has always kind of bothered me. Because that's, in the first reading of it, just a a brief reading, 
It's letting me know that there's a there's something I got to do to receive the forgiveness of sins. It's telling me that Jesus dying on the cross was not enough. If, if my not forgiving others means that God's not going to ultimately forgive me, then that means it's on my shoulders. And that's not what Scripture's saying. That's not what Jesus is saying here. See, in this appendix, think of this as the, these two verses as the appendix to the Lord's Prayer, this, this, this disciple's prayer. What Jesus is saying is that if we have truly experienced God's forgiveness, we will have a readiness to forgive others. If we have truly received the forgiveness of God in our own lives, the first thing we're going to do is be willing to forgive others. As an example, as an a outpouring of graciousness, an outpouring of mercy and grace. That's what it talks about back in verse 12. In fact, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, he says, And bearing one another, if one of you has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, you must forgive. It's expected that if we have received the blessings of God, if we have received that forgiveness, we're going to turn around and forgive others as well. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ also forgave you. Period. So he was not teaching that believers earned God's forgiveness by forgiving others. That's contrary, totally contrary to everything that's taught in the word of God about free grace and free mercy from God. He's saying, as I said before, if we have experienced, truly experienced God's forgiveness, we will have an immediate readiness to turn around and forgive others, to not hold their accounts against them long term. We have to have that readiness to forgive. The expectation there is that a true child of the king would mimic the father. We would mimic his actions. We would mimic his love and be willing to forgive personal offenses as well. Those who have done things against us and those who have offended us, we would be willing to mimic God. Have we not offended God? Have we not offended a holy God? Have we not, in our lifestyle and our actions, our thoughts and our speech, have we not offended God? And yet, how does he treat us? How did he treat us? He died for us. He forgave us. He willingly went to the cross and paid the debt that he did not owe so we might be forgiven. So we, in turn, must, we're, if we're, if we are children of God, we've got to mimic our Father. We've got to mimic our Heavenly Father. You know, growing up, my, I have a great father. I, I love my dad. He's a great man of God. And as I was a little boy, I used to mimic him the way he lived. I'd mimic his golf swing. I know I've talked about it here before, how what a great golfer my dad is. And even now, at 70-something years old, I still can't beat him. I'm 20 years, over 20 years younger than he is. And I cannot beat my dad in golf. I watch his swing. I watch exactly how he does it. I watch how he putts. I watch how he does everything in the, in the game. And I cannot mimic it per personally, perfectly rather. See, it's the same way with our, our faith. We are to mimic God's actions. That's that which he has done to us, we ought to also do to others. See, one thing I've learned is the measure by which we are willing to forgive shows the measure of gratitude we have toward God. If he's forgiven you for a lot, you're willing to forgive a lot. But yet, when you have such a small view of your sin, you're not willing to forgive others, even their small sins against you. We have to recognize that every sin that we commit is a big sin. Every idle word that we speak that is hurting and cutting is a big sin. Every thought that we think that is against holy God is a big sin. Every sin we commit is a big sin. There are no little sins in God's kingdom. Personal fellowship with God is in view in these verses. 
See, one cannot walk in fellowship with God if he refuses to forgive others. Your personal fellowship with God, in other words, is on trial. And one of the tests of your walk with God is how willingly, how readily, readily, and how quickly you're willing to forgive others. Now I know there are people who have hurt you. I know there are people who have crossed you. I know there are people who have offended you. I know. Because it's happened to me as well. It's happened to every one of us. We've all been offended. But the difference between you and me and somebody else who's not walking with God is our willingness and how quickly and how readily we are willing to offer forgiveness to somebody else. A Christian's forgiveness is based on recognizing how much we've been forgiven. We've been forgiven a lot. A lot. A lot. So how in turn do we turn around then forgive others? 70 times 7. The story in, in the Bible, Jesus talks about how many times should I for, be willing to forgive my brother who's offended me? Seven times, the man asked, thinking that he was a lot, that I'll forgive somebody seven times. Jesus says, no, not seven times. Seventy times seven. And that doesn't mean we get out of a little book and we go, okay, 70 times seven, that's 490 times. So I'm going to only forgive you 490 times. That's it, you're done, you're cut off. Imagine if that was God's criteria for forgiving you and I. If God only forgave us 490 times. See, seven is a perfect number. It's an ongoing, it's an eternal number in Scripture. He said, not just forgive seven times, but 70 times seven. So you forgive that person as many times as is needed. You forgive them. And you forgive them before they ask. Before they even ask. So when they come to you, and finally they're, because that, that person also has to get their heart right, right? They have to get their heart right with God. They have to get their heart right with you. And so when they finally come to you and say, I'm sorry, David, I, I messed up. I'm sorry for I offended you. You can say, no problem. I have already forgiven you. Imagine how quickly that relationship can be restored. If you say, I love you, I've already forgiven you. I forgave you the moment it happened. That's what happens in the life of a believer. As we experience the forgiveness of God, and we turn around and forgive others as well. But somebody who has never not experienced the forgiveness of God in their own lives will not have an easy time forgiving somebody else. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He says, if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. In reality, kind of flip that around. If you have received the forgiveness of God, you should go out and be willing to forgive others. But then in verse 15, if you don't forgive others, your, your Father will not forgive your, your offenses. Flip that around. If you've not received the forgiveness of God yet, you will have a really hard time forgiving others. See, the willingness and the openness and the speediness of being able to forgive others is evidence and evidence of a changed heart and evidence of changing character. Remember, that's what Jesus is about. We've been talking about that since the beginning of chapter 5 where he went through the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the humble, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's not about changing behavior. It's about changing character. It's about changing us from the inside out. If you just change the outside behavior, that's short term. That can be changed in a heartbeat. That'd be changed with the weather, like you're in Colorado. One day it's warm, it's 50, 60 degrees. Next day you got two feet of snow on the ground. But when you change a person's character, that's lifetime change. That's long term change change. So the question today is where does your personal relationship with God in relation to this as you learn to pray, as you model this prayer and then as you learn to forgive others. 
See, we've seen that true praying is a family affair, right? We're praying to our Father. He's not just some God. He's my Heavenly Father. I'm His child. It's a family affair. And if the members of the family are not getting along with one another, how can they claim to have the right, the right relationship with the Father? If my goal is to make sure my vertical relationship is correct, and yet I'm unwilling to forgive those in the horizontal plane of my relationships, all of the people around me, how can I claim, if that is off, how can I claim that my vertical relationship is correct? How can I claim that my relationship with God is, on, is where it needs to be if I'm unwilling to do what can be seen by others? The emphasis in 1 John chapter 4 is that we show our love for God by loving our brothers, right? They will know you're Christians by your love. By your love for what? For the world? For football? For baseball? For mountain climbing? No. The, the evidence there and the, the picture there in 1 John chapter 4 is they will know you are Christians by your love for one another. For other believers in Christ, for the church, for the body, for the community of faith as we come together. And when we forgive each other, we're not just earning the right to pray. The privilege for prayer is part of our relationship with God. It's part of being sons and daughters of all Almighty God. It's part of being in the family of God, our right to prayer. It's, we're not earning the right. It is our right to communicate with God. And forgiveness also is in that matter of fellowship. See, because if I'm not in a fellowship with God, I can't pray effectively. I don't want to pray. The last thing I want to do, if I'm in sin, if I'm living in sin, or I have an unforgiving spirit, the last thing I want to do is talk to God. How about you? The last thing we want to do is talk to God. Well, I can get into my Bible. I can read. Uh, I can read the uh, do not judge that you won't be judged for then you'll be judged by the sin. I, I can read all day long. Because that's just the words on the page sometimes. But when you get alone, you get in your closet, you get alone with God. There's no hiding. There's no pretense about what you're carrying inside. If that... If that forgiveness is not there on the horizontal plane, this relation, vertical relationship with God is not going to be there either. We have got to get that under control. Since prayer involves glorifying God's name and hastening the coming of God's kingdom and helping to accomplish God's will on earth, the one praying must not have sin in his heart. That's why Jesus says, he goes back and he says, God, forgive my debts. I cannot be harboring sin in my life. And bring me not into temptation. Do not let me fall into the sins that Satan is laying out before me. We have got to deal with the sin in our hearts. If God had answered the prayers of a, a believer with, with an unforgiving spirit, he would dishonor his own name, Warren Wearsby says. He would dishonor his own name. This is holy God. And yet if he answered our prayers with, with sin in my life, that would be dishonoring his own name. I mean, how could God work through such a person to get his will accomplished on this earth? If we're praying, God, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, how can he work through us if we are harboring sin and unforgiveness in our own hearts? If God gave in to my request, he would just be encouraging sin. He would just be encouraging it. That's why it's so important that we deal with it, that we get this forgiveness, we get this unforgiveness out of our hearts. See, the important thing about prayer is not simply wanting to get the answer, but in being the kind of person that God can trust with the answer. 
Can he trust you? Are you the kind of person that God can trust with the answers to your prayers? Are you that kind of person? Are you trying to approach God with a sin of unforgiveness in your heart? Maybe you need to, who do you need to forgive this morning? Maybe you need to spend some time this morning at the end of the service. I'm going to encourage you to go and get away by yourself, each and every one of you, as you're watching it this morning. Go and get by yourself for 5 to 10 to 15 minutes, and you deal with the sin in your own heart. It's Sunday morning. There's snow on the ground. You're not going to go anywhere anyway. There's nothing else going on today. You, King Supers is closed. There's snow on the roads. You don't want to be going out. Lunch is still down the road. Take a few moments when we finish service this morning. You take 5, 10, 15 minutes. Go alone by yourself. And you ask yourself, God, who am I harboring an unforgiving spirit towards? Maybe a family member? Somebody in the room, the room with you right now? A mother, a father, a spouse, a child? Maybe it's a co-worker? Somebody at work who's ticked you off? Who's offended you? Maybe it's an ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend that you just have a really hard time forgiving because they did something or said something to you that really hurt. But you need to ask for, you need to get forgiveness and offer forgiveness to them. Maybe it's an ex-spouse, an ex-husband or ex-wife. And I know that the relationship has been severed. I know that it's probably not going to get back to where it was, but wouldn't it be nice if you were on speaking terms? That ex-husband or that ex-wife, you need to forgive them. You need to forgive. I don't know what it is. Could have been some verb, something verbal. Could have been something physical. Could have been something financial. It could have been an adulterous situation. I don't know what it is in your life. But you need to be willing to forgive. Maybe you got offended by a former pastor or a church member at another church. And you just can't get over the offense that you receive there. And so therefore, now that you're coming into another congregation, you're coming into another church, you're bringing all that baggage with you, and you have a hard time trusting your pastor now because somebody else, another pastor offended you, another pastor hurt you. Or you're having a hard time trusting other members in the church, other, others who want to love you and others who want to worship with you, others who want to participate with you in Bible studies and outreach activities to reach this world for Christ, but you have a hard time opening up because you were hurt. You need to go this morning and ask forgiveness and offer forgiveness. This morning's hard. It's tough. I get it. Living the way the Bible tells us to it is not natural by the world's standards. We have been given a task of living a countercultural life in this world. The world tells us A, B, C is okay, when really A, B, and C is not okay. It goes against Holy God. It doesn't make any sense in God's kingdom. And we are here asking God's kingdom to be present in us and us in our communities. So his light might shine. So we might be salt and light and he might flow through us into our communities. The Christian life is countercultural to what the world says is normal. And that's okay. That's okay. We just need to acknowledge it. I want to pray right now for everybody who's watching that God would bring one or two faces to your mind right now, faces that you need to forgive. Maybe it happened 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. I don't know. Maybe it happened last month or last year. But you need to be willing to forgive. So as you go to your prayer closet in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to, the, the, the face that's coming into your mind maybe right now, that you would offer forgiveness for that person. And then if you feel led, if you feel like you're able to, write that person, communicate with them, say, no, 
I'll let you know that this event that it took place in our past together, it hurt. It was very offensive to me. But I forgive you. Would you do that? Would you begin this week with a clear conscience and a clear mind and a spirit, this horizontal plane that we live in with one another? Let it be clear. And not just because we don't want to have guilt, but because we desire this relationship with God to be so special. Let me pray right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for this church and for the people who are watching online right now. And I pray that right now, God, you would bring one or two faces into their minds of people they need to forgive, be willing to forgive. I know where it took place. I know it was painful. It wasn't my life. I know it isn't theirs. And it's not going to be easy. But start us down this journey so that as we come before you in prayer, in worship, this earthly relationship will hinder the eternal relationship we are seeking with you. God, we love you. We thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for setting an example for us. And let all we do and say be done to the glory and honor of this week. Have a blessed day. I trust and pray that you'll have a great day outside. Go make some snowmen. Go make some snow angels. Go build a fort. Build a snowball fight.